Anyway, so I am a poet. I teach here in the English department. I teach um, first year writing, English 110. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about being a poet and the process of uh, writing poetry. And then I'll go into reading some poems. I'm going to read two uh, different styles of poems. I'm going to read some free verse poems that I wrote uh, in my first collection of poems called Routes Home. And then I'll read what I write now, uh, which is haiku. And that's hard to explain, but I'll, I'll do my best. So and in terms of poetry, um, I get sort of the same reaction. And it's sort of three different reactions when I. So as a poet, I get sort of three different reactions when I tell people that I'm a poet. The first <coughs> is typically, um, it's esoteric, and I'm weird, and they just write me off, and we change the subject, because they don't understand the genre. The second um, is they are too a poet. That happens often, um, which is not necessarily true. But they think they are. So they want to bond in that manner, and they immediately sort of uh, audition for me and sort of recite a poem from memory. Or they ask me, can they forward me poems, and can they get feedback? Um, so that, that's the other reaction. The third reaction is sort of uh, strange, and it happens to me a lot. Um, I think in terms of, uh, or sort of reflects, I think it reflects the uh, idea or concept of intersectionality. Uh, they say something like, oh, right, so do you write uh, angry black woman poetry? Mm -hmm. That has literally been said to me. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. I, I try to, I, I want to think that that's in, in some sort of innocent way asking me, do I do spoken word? Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and I don't do spoken mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so poetry and spoken word, literary poetry and spoken word poetry are, are two different things, but people tend to mesh them together, particularly if, you, particularly if you're a person of color. Mm -hmm. They automatically think that you do spoken word. Well, I don't do spoken word. Um, in terms of poetry, and talking about the process of poetry, I think, I think, and this is not statistical, you know, factually or, or, or statistical fact, it's just my gospel, but I think that there are three different ways people come to poetry. There are three reasons why people write, might, write, uh, might write a poem. Um, the first is that you're writing through grief, and you're using it as a grief process. So you are writing, unbeknownst to you, an elegy. The second reason is that uh, you have found some sort of beauty in nature, or even in humanity, right? and you want to sort of record that beauty in that moment. And that's a pastoral. Um, usually it has to do with nature, but it's a pastoral. And that has to do with imagery. You, you have this image, and you want to sort of make a record of it. The third, um, is sort of the angry black woman poetry. It's a rant. It's when you're writing um, because you're angry, or there's something sort of political uh, happening that you want to sort of um, expel. So you use poetry as a way to do that. Um, th those are really the reasons why I, I think you're a poet. Has anybody ever attempted to write a poem here? Or does anybody write poetry? Do you feel that each time you've, you've written one of those reasons is the mm -hmm. reasons why? Yes. yes. OK, good. So we're on the same page. So I'm a poet because I write, uh, I started writing through the grief process. My mother passed away when I was 30 years old. And I was a first time mom. My son was maybe nine months old. And she died in a car accident. So it was a sudden death. And she died in the place that I'm going to talk about in these poems. She died in Stewart, Virginia, which uh, we fondly call Patrick County, Virginia. And she died there, and she was born there. So there was a lot of uh, work, grief work that I had to do, and I didn't know really what to do with all that grief. <clears throat> so I started writing. At the time, I wasn't a poet. So I just simply started writing. I, had, I was very lucky in the sense that I had friends who were poets. And they could sort of look at my work and say, this is, this is good. You have something here. There's, we can see you know, talent. But I, didn't, I didn't know. I, didn't, I had not formally studied poetry at all. But I was lyrical. I had that natural ability to be lyrical when I wrote. So I wrote a poem called Bypath, which I'll read right now. And that poem <clears throat> got some really 
uh, generated some really good feedback from other writers, and I sent it to a journal called the African American Review. And that is, um, some of you may be familiar with the African American Review, and they published it, which was strange. <laughs> I had never published anything. I had never really sit, you know, sat down and, and, and written a uh, poem in its entirety. And I had no formal training. So at that point, I thought, oh my god, am I a genius? No, I didn't. <laughs> but I did want to pursue poetry at that point. So that's when I started looking into MFA programs and, and uh, pursuing it uh, in, uh, through formal study. But I'll read by path that was written when I had no idea what I had. I was not even well read. I had not even read poetry at this point. Mm. <clears throat> by path, red earth lures us off the main road, up to the grown-up graveyard, and everyone is dead: the buried, the tenders, and the flower bringers. We route on through cloud grazing pines, where sunlight ends a short yard in. And I imagine when grandfather plowed this land, his very own to figure and trim. We are fearsome of snake venom, on female foot with not even a stick. Uncertain of its course and spill, or worse, its boondocks doom. <clears throat> it creeps and curves on. We slow some, then quicken. It echoes our laughter and screams, and it leads us through to the triumph of a traveling spring, chattering the perfectness of morning light, a clear day, a campfire under indigo black. We wade water, stretch our necks to the pines, dance in the rays that make it through. And this path, a new companion, has led us to all we ever saw. So that was a path. I'll talk a little bit about, if I can, the place, which is Patrick County, Virginia. It is the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, it's, it's hard to describe. It is rural living, rural life. Uh, when I was a child, there was a, a population of about 800 in Stewart, Virginia. 80% or I would say maybe 89% were white and 7 or so percent um, were black. So it was my black family in the midst of, of acres and acres and acres of people who had tons of, you know, they were farmers, they were sharecroppers, there were outhouses, there were many dirt roads, so everyone lived up of a dirt road. Um, there are two major routes in Stewart, Route 1 and Route 58. People did not have dumpsters. They burned trash. If you could imagine all the aspects of rural living, that's what it was. Um, it was sharing of, of food. So farmers just bought food and just left it on your, your carport or your porch. Now there's a farmer's market there, which is funny to me because everybody's farmers. But um, so I don't know who's supporting who. But, and there was a lot of moonshine. And there was no ABC store. So there was just homemade liquor, if anybody's familiar with that. <laughs> and my family was sort of complicit in that business uh, at some point. But that was what, uh, what it was. And so these, these long walks and by path that we went on, there was nothing to do in the evenings, and we were children. So we would literally just take these long paths into, uh, into the woods and see where it, it led out. Because my grandmother would say, oh, if you just keep walking, you'll find a creek. We're like, well, we've been walking for it. Well, just keep walking, you'll find a creek. And things like that. It was, it was a um, interesting life for me uh, because I was from the city. I was from uh, DC, so we had what what I like to refer to as the concrete jungle, um, and it was hard living. But we were dumped in the south every summer. My mother gave gave us that gift um, of of going south every summer and staying with my grandmother. And I had a cousin as well who who stayed with me with my grandmother in the summers. And I want to read a couple of poems or at least one point about her. Okay. This poem is called Miss Pris. We sat stranded in heels, each full of good pastime, berries to pick, creeks to wade. Why on earth she sat content petting that old retired shepherd, I'll never know. I could throw a rock clean across a pasture, 
and her dainty hands could barely shape a fist. She idled all day painting of her toenails and complaining of the sun. Thank you, she purr when I fetched her tea. Certainly, Miss Press, it's my pleasure, I do believe. <laughs> so, uh, the other point I wanted to or move on to is progress. So when we talk about migration, half of my family migrated and left sharecropping because it was too, uh, bright leaf tobacco priming. And they left that area because they didn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> that was very difficult work. So they migrated to the Washington, D.C. area. And a lot of them sort of, first they washed dishes and did things like that. And they ended up working uh, in government. And so there was much more opportunity for work there, but in many ways the living was even harder mm -hmm. because you were living in small, you know, congested apartments and there was poverty and there were all the things that you didn't have in the South. So you may have had poverty in the South, but everything was plentiful. You owned lots of land, you had a big house, you had firewood, you had food because you had a garden and all of those things, but you said, you know, that work was difficult, so you wanted to migrate and, ha and have opportunity, and that, and that makes sense. Um, but there, there are all kinds of uh, things that happen to the black psyche when, when we did that as well. So I'm going to read a poem called Progress, and it's about my aunt, who was the first uh, person in our family to move north. Some people don't consider D.C. north, but <laughs> compared to Patrick Henry, it is. <coughs> Progress is a crop farmer's daughter, photographed in a swirl bouffant and sweat lashes after going all the way through Virginia's colored high school. It's heading north, encouraged by what's possible for blacks in a city, a life beyond red road fields, crawling tractors, and curing brightly. It's arriving, slew-footed, clad in a plaid dress, ashamed, changing your name from Billy to Betty. It's a south side room for rent, nights spent spraying cafeteria plates, days stocking library shelves. It's a kinder exhaustion, a better pay. It's the rush of streets, the nights lit brighter than the sun reflects off the pond. It's the months it takes you to look up when someone says, Betty, the new girl. <clears throat> So, I'm going to read a couple of more from here. I did not read my pro prefatory, my preference poem. But did I read my preference poem? Yes, I did. Okay. So, yeah, I'm going to read a few more from here. So, as I said, my family was a bit complicit in the moonshine business. <laughs> um, and uh, we had very interesting characters because of that in my family. And I wanted to read a couple of poems from those characters. So my, um, my grandmother's sisters, uh, my grandmother not so complicit, but my grandmother's sisters were. And there was lots of canning and jars of uh, peach schnapps and all those things, shells and shells of it. Really pretty to look at, uh, but it was also for sale. And uh, so they did interesting things. And li literally, I remember being a child and going to one of their houses, and they lived in the mountains, but they would be tucked away, not off of main roads, just really tucked away. And I, you know, you'd go to their house, and we'd get out the car, and one of my aunts would say, you know, I had a, you got a lot of dogs here. Do these dogs bite? And she was like, yeah, they'll bite you. You know, and you just had to sort of walk through and hope they didn't bite you, because that was the purpose of the dogs. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they were, um, you know, they sold moonshine, so that's, that was the purpose of the dogs. But anyway, I want to talk about two of those relatives. Uh, one was my, my grandmother's sister, who was a typical mountain woman. So she did drink a lot, she pawned fish, she did pottery. At the end of her life, she had a store in our town, in, in the town of Stewart, um, that sold her pottery. Um, but she was a, a, kind of had this rock star status in my family because she, was such, she had such a colorful personality. Her name was Ruth, and this is called Whole Fish. My Aunt Ruth slumbers over a plate of whole fish she fried moments before in cornmeal and oil, swearing the entire time she would eat every bite. Before frying her fish, she had taken a break 
to smoke a slim and drink a shot of Jack. Needed some Jack, she said, after that fishing trip. The black bass angry, steel clipping slow intervals in a bucket of one inch water then, had moments before endured a ghastly tug of war, two predators fighting ferociously over him. Aunt Ruth in her flimsy garden hat, pulling at him on her lucky pole, and a moccasin's throat clamped around his tail fin, pulling back. My aunt yelling victorious at first glimpse, then screaming in terror at what rose with it. Anyone would have thrown it back at once, pole too if need be, but my Aunt Ruth, a lady of scuffling instinct, picked up a stick and beat the moccasin off her hooked fish. Take that, she chided, as the moccasin let go, receding back into the pond. Moments before, she had sat almost asleep on the sunning dock, complaining of nothing biting. <laughs> other colorful person I will read about is my Uncle Jack, if I can find. And Uncle Jack was my great-grandfather's brother. Great Uncle Jack. Everyone put on their funeral faces, their dusted off suits and dresses. We've come together for our brother Jack, said the minister. Every eye in the church dry. Jack, my great-great-uncle, had lived in a shack on a wooded hill. One room, one window, and a stove. In the, electric, in the electric, electricity free hole, he called a castle, because he had been a king there, never, ha never having married. He did as he pleased, drank moonshine by sunlight, wore only overalls, did all his shacking 20 yards away from the family church where everyone now sat trying to picture Jack at heaven's pure gates. As a strange guest, his senile sister has invited, rises to the microphone and belts out the worst sung hymn ever laid to ears. <laughs> <laughs> everyone fighting laughter with fierce smile. My Uncle James, now in tears, so close to bursting, he's up to find the closest exit. So. It's what happens when you're trying to bury someone who <laughs> has not lived a perfect life. Um, let's see, what was the last one I was going to read from this story? So, if the pictures are behind me, that's Phil Potsdam. Mm -hmm. Has anybody been, been to mm -hmm. Phil Potsdam? Okay, it's very close to the story. Also, you might see a picture there. This is my grandfather. Mm -hmm. So the most famous person from Stewart happens to be um, my grandfather's brother, on this side, his name is Turner Fredrell. They formed the Fredrell Brothers, which uh, are bluegrass musicians. It was a bluegrass band. Um, and it, it was, it, they were pretty famous uh, in that local area. And then they went on and did national tours and world tours. Uh, so we come from kind of banjo picking, real mountain sort of people. Um, and it's very unique for, uh, in the African American mm -hmm. culture, you don't have a lot of that. And I'm really surprised, and I'm very happy for Rihanna Gideons, who's receiving a lot of attention for that right now, who actually lives in Greensboro, mm -hmm. because we did that years ago and received you know, not nearly the attention that uh, we should have in, in my family. Although they did win awards and they were played on the radio, and sometimes I can literally turn on uh, a station at UNC and hear somebody who's very eclectic and knows music very well is, is, would be playing my grandfather's song because he also recorded albums. Mm -hmm. But um, so he was literally the most famous person <laughs> from Stuart. And if you look Stuart up, that his, his name may come up. Or certainly if you Google the Fredrell Brothers, they may come up. Um, did not get much in here about his music, but I do have a poem that mentions bluegrass. So I will um, read that. It's called Sipping and Thinking. And it has a, sort of an epigraph. It's not really an epigraph, but it's a little sort of quote there. Don't really nothing compare to a root beer with crushed ice. I pondered how Jimmy could say that with certainty. He never left the foothills. 
and they were wide with known eternities between farmhouses, rainstorms, dusk, and mornings. He knew mostly of pond fishing. Of course, he began, there's an art to it, the way your fingers wrap the pole. With a trail of bluegrass radio from a passing pickup, I could make his voice disappear, replace it with a flighty thought. Still, I pondered as we rested hot under that rotting old oak, how he could say that and be absolutely right. And I think I will read one, one more from here. I ended on a poem called, ended this collection of a poem called Personals. Uh, Personals was a title taken from a renowned poet named C.D. Wright, if anybody's familiar with C.D. Wright's work. Um, she's been around a long time. She was from, I believe C.D. is from Tennessee. So she sort of wrote uh, Southern poetry, but just, um, you know, she was white. So her, hers is not that much different because it's Southern rural living, but um, the experience is different, as you might imagine. Okay, personals after C.D. Wright. And this talks a little bit about uh, how I was feeling after um, my mother passed away, and it talks also about the land as well. 30 years under your belt, you drag baggage place to place and call that burden enough. Then you wake one day alone, your mother's voice constant since the womb, even the silence of your father's distant love all gone. I haven't been right with the world since. It's a way you navigate as best you can. I often raise a whiskey glass. If you're hell bound, at least take the scenic route. <laughs> I often blame the South, where hardship is worshiped in the twanged tales of someone jailed, someone's land the bank has taken, someone's queer child God has completely forsaken. Here, no one has carried less than you. It's the quarrel of crickets at night rivaling. Who can cry loudest under weeping willows, grandstands of growth that fall down bent over everything? There's a reason they thrive best here. Okay, so that is uh, the blue. This is called Lover's Leap, and it is um, it's a horrible name. It's, it's a mountain. It's a cliff. <laughs> but um, it's very pretty. If you stand up there, you can just sort of see down into the foothills. Um, and there's one picture that I was hoping that would come up that my grandmother had, a lot of people had in store, picture windows, so the whole wall will be a window. Mm -hmm. And if you look out, I wanted to show you this, it'll come up. It's a, it's a pasture with cows, and if you see that picture, that's sort of the view from my grandmother's house. Mm -hmm. it, it was really mm -hmm. that, that beautiful. But, at any rate, that is sort of textualizing the rural South. Mm -hmm. I can move on to Haku now. What time do we, how are we doing? Uh, 11, uh, not 11, 12.50. <laughs> so oh, so, okay. so, because I want us to also do an exercise. I want us, if that's okay, to attempt to write a haiku. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> 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 haikus are really good. Really you can write them in your mind. You don't have to physically write them down, although you might want to. Um, so I moved on. I was really, when I wrote this collection, and I have a second collection called Running Music, uh, and Running Music is more so about uh, my experience mothering. I call it Running Music uh, in a metaphorical way because it was a sort of escape. So I was running from the death of my parents. I was running literally. I was running all the time. I ran like five miles a day sometimes. Um, I was running physically, running metaphorically. And it's also about mothering and, and motherhood. So mothering my two boys and then sort of the juxtaposition of myself being mothered and, and not having a mother at, the, at this point in my life. So running music uh, still talked about a lot of the past. And I began to sort of, well, it's depressing <laughs> when you write in the past all the time. And I was a poet of memory, and I understood that, much like Philip Levine and, and poets who, every time you read something about them, they're talking about something that happened 20 or, or 40 years ago. I understand that, 
it's easy to do that because it, a nostalgia fits fits in well with the genre of poetry. But uh, it can be very depressing because rarely are you looking back on something that was contentment. <laughs> when you're looking back, you're, you're usually looking back on uh, pain and grief. So I, I really got tired of being a poet of memory and writing about grief. So in my writer's group, there was a gentleman. It's called the African American Writers Collective. We're a statewide group, and we're in every part of the state. But we meet together once a month, and we, we you know, we revise work, we read work, we do exercises, we do all of that. Everybody, every every writer, I feel like means a writer's group. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. he was, uh, he's the leader of our group, but he also is a haiku poet, and he was a haiku poet for many, many years, and was the the first black. Um, president of the National Haiku Society. He won this huge award, uh, Tokyo Museum Award. award, award. It's an international uh, haiku award that they just don't give away to anyone. And he won that many years ago. Uh, had, it comes with a really big cash prize and a trip to, uh, to Tokyo, Japan. At any rate, so he wrote haiku all the time. And I thought, this is such a strange thing. Why is he writing haiku? This is a Japanese form. What is he getting out of this? You know. And uh, I started to read his haiku, and I, and I did like some of what I was reading and trying to critique it at the same time. And he implored me to write haiku. He said, you should write some haiku. And I thought, OK. And I realized uh, how difficult it was when I started to attempt it. It is not easy to write micro poetry. It's not easy to be poignant um, within you know, seven to nine months. <laughs> it's not easy to do. And so I became challenged by it. By it. And I also liked it because haiku is to be present in the moment. So I wasn't writing about the past anymore. I was now writing in the present. And I was being very aware of nature and, and the setting around me and trying to find some sort of meaning in it. And so this book comes about because he asked me, uh, he challenged me to write a haiku once a day for a whole year. <laughs> but I did it, and some of them were terrible, and some of them were really, really great. Uh, but the whole process helped me to become a haiku writer, and that was his, his whole point, really. So I'll read some haiku. He also, and, and other members of my group that write haiku, um, and I should say that we have a book coming out. It's, it's a collaborative, uh, co-authored edition of haiku. It's the first of its kind. It's all African-American. Uh, haiku writers, mm -hmm. and we will be premiering it at National Art Museum uh, at Duke. Well, it's cool. not at yeah. Duke, but oh, National yeah. Museum. Uh -huh. We'll be premiering it there February 22nd. That'll be nice. the opening night. So, cool. but at any rate, so he, he and the other members of my group, when we write haiku, sometimes we do write based upon Japanese culture. We write about cherry blossoms and things like that. A lot of times we write, we repurpose haiku, and we write about the African American culture mm -hmm. and ex our experiences. Um, which they are really accepted now. I just came from a haiku concert, co uh, conference, and they seem to be, they like it a lot. We didn't know if they would or not. We didn't really, we weren't concerned. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, they liked it a lot, and you know, some people read some papers and some criticism about it, and it was, it was really nice. But I'll read a couple of uh, haiku that, that are in this book, and they were pretty successful. Actually, yeah. And then I'll read. So, and I, when you read haiku, I'll have to read it twice because it takes you a moment to sort of digest. Mm -hmm. Okay, white wildflowers, I decide to stop hiding my gray. White wildflowers, I decide to stop hiding my gray. Plantation tour, I follow the swallowtail to the slave house. Plantation tour. I follow the swallowtail to the slave house. This one I actually wrote in Stuart. We gather in black outside the church, autumn mountains. We gather in church, we gather in black outside the church, autumn mountains. Another mass shooting, my son practices his trumpet solo. Another mass shooting, my son practices his trumpet solo. I write a lot of haiku about my sons. 
gravesite visit. My son calls the, the cemetery heaven. Gravesite visit. My son calls the cemetery heaven. And this one is another one you can sort of see how it's repurposed to, to uh, uh, with, with, uh, the, so you could experience the black American culture. Family feud. They adjust and readjust the casket wreath. Family feud. They adjust and readjust the casket wreath. Okay, so do we have any questions about the free verse poetry that is steeped in place or the haiku? So can you just explain exactly what is the haiku, what creates the haiku, what are the rules? I'm not, I mean, they're, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how, you know, how to write one, so. Okay, yeah, so, okay, so haiku <laughs> is, and, you know, you've, it's not true, I should say, uh, that the form is 37 or 575, that, that's just kind of, I don't know who even created that form, the masters, Bashu and Issa, did not write in 575. So that's some sort of form that somebody uh, wanted to adhere to haiku to maybe make it uh, easy, because haiku is not easy. Basically, uh, there are several rules with haiku. One is it needs to have a nature element. So the haiku come, should come, you should be inspired uh, by something in nature. It needs to have a nature element. Secondly, it needs to be a juxtaposition. So it's sort of um, how that moment in, in nature makes you feel. It should have tension. So in some of my haiku, you, you'll you feel uh, tension, like in another mass shooting, my son practices his trumpet solo. You feel the, the two um, things coming together. So <clears throat> it should have tension. It doesn't have to be, like I said, 575. It's sort of a, I, I feel like it's a meditation, but it's also a manifestation. How, like when we, the, the what is the poem by, when he talks about the roads uh, dividing. Robert, Robert Thomas. Yeah, yeah. And he talks about which road does he take. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, that's a metaphor. So here, he, and that's almost a haiku, because he's walking down a path, it begins to fork, and he says, you know, which road to take? Which, which, what is going to lead me to the best, you know? And then he literally is talking about, you know, best life, to the best end of his life. So that, that would be haiku, really. And it's sort of this manifestation of that natural element. What is that? What does that make you feel? Like rain mist. Here's one that I wrote about rain mist. Let's see. I'll try to give you some more nature ones here. I think I even know it. I should not even be looking it up. Rain mist. Needing the sister I stopped speaking to. Ocean balcony down miles of shoreline. Silent fireworks. <clears throat> and they can be funny too. They don't have to all be serious. This one is funny. Lost in the city, quarreling under one umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> so that's more like sing you. But um, yeah. So you can so when I when I ask you to try one, I it is it needs to be in the moment. So we're not standing outside and looking, you know, at immersed in nature right now. But if you think about something over the fall break and a place that you were, um, there was probably a moment when you were in that place that you, you know, you were experiencing the place, that you felt, you know, something. You weren't just thinking about, you know, the dishes or next week or what I have to do, you know, when I get back to Elon. You know, there was a moment where you were just enjoying that space, that moment that you were in. So if you could go back to that moment of a fall break, it could be in your garden. It could be, you know, anywhere. Or you may have seen a beautiful sunset, or you may have been, you know, a gust of wind may have um, made you stop and think. But those are haiku moments, we like to call them. Haikuists, we like to call them. So does any, yes? I have a couple questions. Um, the, the first has to do with, you've complicated the, the definition of haiku. Can you trace that to a particularly African-American tradition? 
some of the early writers who would have been writing poetry that you might classify or put into this tradition. But at the time, obviously, they were not called haiku writers. So a lot of early, really early African American poets like Phyllis Wheatley and Langston Hughes and um, and Conte, uh, Conte Cullen. Cullen, yes, a lot of them they they did not write short poems and they were not experimental. They wanted to be in form mm -hmm. and they wrote in form because that was what everyone else was doing. Mm -hmm. And in order for them to have that acceptance, they had to do that and do it, of course, twice as well. <laughs> but they had to do that in order uh, to receive that acceptance as a poet. There were poets uh, later on in life, African American po poets, who decided they were going to take a little bit of liberty, and they were going to write free verse, and they were going to do it the way they wanted to. Two of those poets, one of one of my favorite poets, is Lucille Clifton, mm -hmm. who wrote little poems. Right? They were little poems, lot. I mean, very poignant, lot, jam packed uh, with emotional content, and you know, she talked about adversity. Is that her right there? No, that's no, no, that's no, that's Lucy looks just like that. <laughs> One of her pictures looks just like that. But at any rate, so she decided to start writing short poems. Um, and when asked why, she had a work-life uh, family balance problem. She had like stair-step children, and she had like six of them. So she didn't have time to write long poems. <laughs> so she wrote short poems. Uh, Sonia Sanchez, I would say, would be our, our person to look to because she wrote haiku. And when she wrote haiku, it was not necessarily about nature, but it was about jazz mm -hmm. and, and how jazz made her feel and sort of these feelings that came up um, and how she was inspired by jazz. So, and we call it jazz haiku. It's not necessarily, it is about jazz, but it's more so about her sound and her syllables and, and how it was coming through in that musical way. So she would be another one. What was her name again? Sonia Sanchez. So my, my other question isn't fully formed, but I'm, I'm feeling almost this tension between your free verse and your haiku poetry as it relates to the land. Um, yeah. And the tension between um, what we're seeing now in terms of kind of real estate racism, basically, gentrification, mm -hmm. um, and sharecroppers giving up land to move to this concrete jungle um, and in an essence almost disenfranchising themselves. And if we know, like understand what's happening in DC now, like where you can't find a reasonable place to rent, um, it, it really makes it sad. Um, and I don't know where I'm going with this, but, well, yeah. but it's, it's, it's interesting to me. I mean, blacks through the diaspora have a really interesting conundrum when it comes to um, land ownership, mm -hmm. displacement. Mm -hmm. I was just home up from the Caribbean um, this oh. summer, and um, my family, for example, owned miles of beach property, which was split up among kids and then who sold and mm -hmm. then like their mm -hmm. hotels. But that land was considered at the time like poor land. It wasn't mm -hmm. arable. It was sandy. Right. So now, though, obviously, it's really prime real estate. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of disenfranchisement is. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that's interesting too. I write about place a lot. A yeah. Haiku sort of requires you to write about place, right? Um, the free verse does not, but that particular uh, collection of poems was about place. I, I thought it was interesting that you know when they decided to migrate. My aunt, the first one I read about, was Progress Betty, when she decided to migrate. Uh, she was the only one that had a high school diploma, the only one who had finished high school. And her option was to go work in the plant. And they're the plant uh, in Stewart, and, the, and they have furniture plants in Bassett and all around there. But the plants that we had in Stewart was like the elastic plant, where you literally inspect t-shirts, and they come across the conveyor belt. And, <laughs> and it is a thankless, long, tedious process every single day. and. Um, um, so she, she didn't want to do that, obviously, and she, she, she migrated to D.C., and there was really nothing for her in D.C. as well. But she did have one relative there, and that relative was able to open up some, some doors um, that then opened up other doors. So she, once it was foreseeable 
by other members of my family that you could do that and not have to work in the plant because you were going to work at the plant or you were going to work in the fields. Mm -hmm. um, they followed suit and so they went and she helped them set up and get apartments and jobs and so forth. And even though they weren't working in what I would consider to be, they didn't have great careers in DC, they certainly made more money and, and there was uh, more opportunity in terms of uh, careers and so forth. But I will honestly say, strangely enough, we own a lot of land in Stewart, Virginia. The streets, the, the roads are named after us. Uh, plenty of them are named after us. And we keep that land, and literally the people who we, we, uh, we don't have homes on the land anymore, but they are trailers on, those, on, on our property, and they all pay rent to us, to, to my family, and they're all white. <laughs> so, so the, it's like a swap, right? <laughs> so, so, but, but you know, I do. I, I find it interesting because when I went back there as a child, I thought this is so beautiful. The, all this land, these rolling hills, you know, gardens and and, and apple orchards. There's lots of apple orchards in Stewart, and. Um, you have to look at that and see what it is. I mean, it's a lot of land, and land is work. You know, <laughs> so you, unless you're wealthy enough to have people work that land, you know, you would have to do it yourself. But it was very beautiful, and we still have it. And I think what will happen that in in your case will happen in our case. They will will it to us, and we will probably uh, sell it off. But the people who we sell it to are people who want to move to the mountains, and they want land, and they want you know mm -hmm. that sort of thing. It it is interesting. But, but you're seeing that reverse migration in the African American community. Yes. People yeah. coming back mm -hmm. from those urban areas to the south. Um, I think your your work though engenders questions for African Americans about what is the good life, mm -hmm. right? And what the models the of success mm -hmm. that people are chasing when they really already have that pot of gold. Yeah, my favorite um, uh, essay uh, in. Um, I'm <laughs> losing my train of thought. Uh, Bell Hook's essay uh, is one of my favorite because t when she talks about the black psyche and how you sacrifice so much and leave so much behind that you didn't even realize you loved, and you can't bring that with the city, to, you know, to the city with you. Like my aunts, I remember they would still cook really big pots of beans and ham hocks, <laughs> you know, in the city, and people all around like, "What is that smell?" You know, it's yeah. like, and they tried to keep as much of that country living what they called it, mm -hmm. as possible. But you couldn't walk outside barefoot, and you couldn't do certain things, you know, and certain things weren't accepted. Your accent uh, was laughed at. If you didn't lose that, and lose that very quickly, uh, you know, you weren't accepted in the city. So I think they missed a lot of that, and every chance they got, they were on a Greyhound home, you know. Mm -hmm. they, summertime came, they were going home, because they did miss that. The, the, it's all economic. It's all economic. If you could have you know, the, 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 the income in the South, in the rural South, that you can have in the North, and the opportunities and the pensions and the mm -hmm. health benefits and all that comes with that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily want to leave, you know? Yeah. But you know, even, I don't want to talk, but, but it's, <laughs> it's so interesting to me, because even in the, when you look at the, the core pie of some of these writers, um, they all go back to the earth. Mm -hmm. so, Alice Walker, in search of our mother's gardens, mm -hmm. Jamaica Kincaid, my garden book. I mean, like they they write about these concrete spaces, urban spaces, but then in their later life, Toni Morrison, all mm -hmm. they all go back to to the rural to the earth yeah. to the rural south, yeah, mm -hmm. where it all started. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think part of that to me seems to be that it was simpler. Living in the living in a rural area is a lot simpler than living in the big city. I've done both too, mm -hmm. and it's a lot simpler than being, you know, in that concrete. There's jungle. certainly more peace of mind. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's it's different. I, I I value that too now. I didn't when I was younger because I wanted to get away from it too, <laughs> you know. But it draws you back somehow. Yeah, well, it's they loved weird. going back because they were vacationing when they went back. <laughs> they went back yeah. to work the land. Yeah. They went back yeah. to vacation. Yeah. 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 I used to go home. My mother laughed at me. I used to go home <coughs> and get all the food that I couldn't get where I was mm -hmm. and take it with me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like go grocery shopping when I came home because I couldn't get it where I was. And they'd laugh, but I was serious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just something about it. 
And I think, like I talked about in, in, the, in uh, the, the flyer that Buffy sent out, the, the idea of the harsh work and, and the land, you know, I, and a lot of that you don't do necessarily in, mm -hmm. anymore in the South. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not a lot of mm -hmm. tobacco priming, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. it's optional. You, if you want a field of corn, you can grow a field of corn. You know, you're not doing it to mm -hmm. feed six, six uh, mouths, six children. So that makes a difference. And I think that they saw that a lot as just hardship and work, mm -hmm. you know, and if they could escape that. That was the goal. Anyone else? Are you guys going to attempt to write a haiku? How much time do we have left? Um, about ten minutes. <laughs> okay. Would you like to attempt to write a haiku? Sorry. Yes. Think about fall break and and space and place and that moment when you could look up and actually be in nature, or you actually felt the breeze, or you actually took a time to like bring the flower close to you and smell the flower or something like that. I'll tell you when I wrote this one uh, a couple of years ago. Spring break, my boys screaming at blue jays. I know it's not easy. It wasn't easy when I wrote it. <laughs> How long does it take you to write something like that? I mean, it usually it's a moment, and I, I spill it, and I write it up, but then I go back and chisel, chisel, and find the absolute, I mean, word economy is everything. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. find absolutely the right words. Mm -hmm. So let's try to write one in our minds. About a full break. They, they can be simple. Then they can be complex at first. So how many lines is this puzzle? Like they can one or three. two, three okay. tops. the evening beach. My dog keeps barking. <laughs> yes. yes. And it is the census. So that's another thing. I'm sorry. You asked me about the rules and I totally left mm -hmm. out one of the most important parts is there should be uh, at least two senses. There should be imagery but two senses. Hearing, touching, smelling. Mm -hmm. Sound was in yours, which is very good. Okay, so I was kind of along there because mine was playing in dirt Zachary barking at my neighbor. <laughs> the dog barking at my neighbor. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm dreaming of cutting down a tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is literally what I did in yeah. fall for. No, yeah, it's, yeah. Mine was what was mine. Oh, fall break, the leaves still green. Mm. Mm -hmm. By now, there's more. Foliage. And there's not, I guess it's been warm. I don't know what, I don't know why it hasn't been warm. Still, still very green. I have one. Coolness tickles my cheek. Micah battles for the ball. Yes, mm -hmm. and my, Micah, who is Micah? My son. Yes. He's in a soccer game. You would say my son battles for the ball because you make it universal. Okay. Yes, but that's good. Mm. And I like that because, yeah, it's like almost, are you sweating? It's like sweating or you're almost like... Well, I, we were standing out and it was misting. Yeah, it was so yeah. just soft yeah. and, but at the same time... Here He's he battling. So you see that, that tension. Sweat. That tension, Battle. yes. Yeah. Anyone else for me? 
typically when you write haiku, at first you write really long haikus, a lot of words, mm -hmm. then you learn to chisel. My students, if I ask them, they write really long haikus. It's like if you're first learning to illustrate, you draw very small or really, or very big or really small, until mm -hmm. you get a sense of. Okay, well this was fun. Does anybody else have any more questions? It's always good to talk about my craft, which I don't get to do a lot when I teach in English. I've got one, I've got one question regarding your work with your students. I was struck by how seemingly effortless your foray into poetry was. And students, initially, you know, mm -hmm. getting from, and students tend to think, I either have talent or I don't, mm -hmm. and there's nothing I can really do about it. Yeah. So how do you, deal with them. When you, when someone on the surface would think, oh, it was easy for you. You're just, you're just naturally yeah. in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, typically with poetry, there there are two entrees. <laughs> you either are sort of, you have a, a natural gift of being lyrical, which mm -hmm. means tone and rhyme and sound, mm -hmm. and that sort of comes natural to you. Um, or, you know, you you write imagery very well. That's that's another one. It, there's certain things that you need to do that poets, other poets, will recognize in your writing and say, you know. And and when you get the, it's like anything. When you get the acceptance of poets, when poets say, because you know, if poets don't love your work, you know, you may not have that um, natural talent. But when you get the acceptance of poets, and some people want that acceptance to the point where they are really ready to do the work. They want to practice. They want to figure out how to get better. The best way to get better as a poet, if you don't have something natural, uh, is to read a lot of poetry mm -hmm. and figure out what those poets are doing. Because mm -hmm. a lot is happening in poetry all the time. The idea with poetry is that you want to do something, the word I'm going to bar from you is seamlessly, something difficult, but you want to do it in a way that it doesn't ever appear uh, to be difficult. You know, Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like you want to rhyme, but you don't want to intentionally rhyme. Mm -hmm. You don't want the Dr. Seuss thing happening. You know, mm -hmm. you want to internal rhyme in your lines, those sort of things. Um, if you're angry in your poetry, you want to do it in the most humble way, mm -hmm. but still, still use those words that you know, so uh, so people understand that you that you are frustrated or angry. But it's very elegant and very heightened language. So. Uh, I would tell them, and it depends, you know, like I said, people either say it's esoteric and they walk away from it and they don't want to deal with it, or if you have a student who really likes poetry and you read their poetry and it's not, you know, quite there, to just read, read more poets. And sort of figure out what they're doing. I, poetry readings, you can go to poetry readings, but they, they tend to be, unless you've read poetry, poetry readings don't really resonate with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you ever go back to the free verse? I do. I'm working on a free verse chapbook right now. Um, I wanted it to be a full collection, but like Lucille Clifton, I have children. <laughs> I don't have time to write a full, a full collection, but um, yeah, I'm working on one right now. It's called Down to Earth. It's, uh, that's borrowed from a Stevie Wonder album mm -hmm. many years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, mm -hmm. I do.